Unless you're wondering why we called you all here today. number one. Um, I did my first World Fantasy Convention in 1988. Um, have incredibly fond memories of just sort of weird little flashes of World Fantasy. World Fantasy, uh, uh, you know, a banquet um, in 1990, I think, in, in Chicago. Maybe 1990. No, I think 1990. Um, in Chicago with Fritz Leiber my table and just getting to talk to Fritz a little bit and he was old and didn't really talk very much at that point but I'm sitting there going, I'm talking to Fritz Lambert. Yeah. Um, the same convention I think being dragged over by someone like Julie Schwartz to meet Robert Bloch. Um, the, the idea of the convention that was you know, world fantasy, yeah, it's a thousand people, but it's a thousand people because it has a numbers cap on it, and in order that it, it, its fundamental nature is almost a gathering place, place of professionals of various kinds with, <coughs> with people who read and appreciate the material and, and are part of fandom around the outside of that. Um, if you're asking why I haven't pulled Stephen King, said, I'm done, I'm done with conventions or whatever, um, I don't know, I, I could get that. Or if I don't get that, no, it, it's more, um, I miss the convention experience. The best convention I've had in the last five or ten years has prob was probably last year's Brighton. Um, convention um, where Steve Jones got me along to the horror convention to interview James Herbert and didn't tell anybody that I was going to be there. And mostly he didn't tell anybody that I was going to be there because I couldn't actually hand on heart promise that I would. So I didn't want to disappoint anybody. Um, but everything magically worked in our favor. I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I was over doing, I, I went in for like a day's Doctor Who promotional stuff and then went off down to Brighton. And because nobody was expecting me and nobody had piles of books and I was a complete and utter surprise to, to everybody in every circumstance, I actually got to have something that was like the conventions that I'd fallen in love with. The reason I went to conventions was to meet people. The reason I went to conventions was because I loved leaving conventions with more friends than I had when I had started, with you know four, five, ten people. But I, I, that person's so cool, and they're part of my life. I like them. Um, and it just seemed as conventions got bigger and that I was more in demand, um, that thing happened less. I, I, I still go to the San Diego Comic Convention. Um, for those of you who have never been to a San Diego comic convention, <laughs> I went to my first San Diego comic convention in 1989. 
and there were 15,000 people there. And I thought, I don't really like this convention, it's too big. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one I went to, I think these days they all cap out at the same number, which is 150,000 people, because that's all the fire marshals will ever allow. Um, and that's all the memberships they put out. But you do have 150,000 people at the convention, plus a sort of weird other, you know, 50,000 people in a sort of support organization who may not actually be in the convention. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I and, and going to San Diego now, um, as I am occasionally brought in by by a film or whatever, and it makes me sad. And it makes me sad because I literally cannot walk the corridors. I can't go. And people say, well, why don't you do what Adam Savage from Mythbusters does? <coughs> he puts on an Imperial Stormtrooper helmet or, or a Joker mask and goes down. Because like, that's actually not what I want. I don't, I don't get pleasure from walking amongst people going, ha, they don't know who I am. I get pleasure from wandering the dealer's room, going up to people I know and saying, hi, how are you? It's been ages. How are you doing? You know, how are your kids? They're how old? And, and having that kind of conversation, which you can't do in a joke from last, but you could do once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but very, very quickly, people are going to be going, you know, Neil Kane was walking around dressed in a joke from last, and the whole thing <laughs> would just, it would be no fun again. Does that kind of answer your question? I like, I like this place, I like these people, I, I think fantasy is incredibly important to me. I'm absolutely aware that from my perspective, being a guest of honor at a World Fantasy Convention, um, is an honor up there with being a guest of honor at you know, the Worldcon, or whatever, in some ways for me more so. Um, I treasure having been the Toastmaster at a World Fantasy Con in 1993 in Minneapolis. I, I treasure having been able to call people like Basil Copper and Roger Zelazny um, up onto the podium and, and introduced them. Um, it was it was big and it was important to me, and that's why I'm here too. Let's talk a little bit about your roots. Um, fantasy and you were publicly experts to so back when you went bad after, after a great start as a journalist writing about the Rand Rand, you strayed <laughs> into this strange field of fantasy. But that wasn't Starting. When, when were you interested in fantasy? Actually, you see, it, it didn't really work like that. I mean, even as a journalist, um, I got my big start as a journalist. I was, I was pottering along, I'd done some music journalism, and there was stuff that sort of, it, you know, I'd do an interview or an article, and it would pay me not very much money. And you said, oh, fantasy, that's the big book. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. What happened was, I wound up going to British Fantasy Convention in 1983 to interview Robert Silverberg for Penthouse. <laughs> um, and it was just one of those weird things where I'd been wanting to do some, wanting to do more interviews with science fiction and fantasy people. I loved fantasy. We go back on that. I loved it. And I thought, well, Gene Wolfe was around for, for fantasy time. And I phoned one of the editors who bought stuff from me, and I said, well, Gene Wolfe is here. And he said, we're not interested in things like that. And I said, oh, well, Bob Silverberg is coming in as the other guest of honor. He said, well, who, who is Bob Silverberg? And I said, well, he's Robert Silverberg. He's, and and I, I did that sort of journalisty thing where you think I have to have some kind of angle. I said, well, he's the man who put sex in his last fiction. <laughs> and the guy said, well, why don't you do the interview for Penthouse? They love anything with a, with a sex slant. And I, went, I would never have thought of that in a million years. So I phoned Penthouse, a very nice Australian editor answered, and I said, uh, interview with Robert Silverberg, the man who put sex in science fiction. He said, yeah, great. Love it. He said, by the way, if you have any way of getting in touch with Douglas Adams, we love a Douglas Adams interview too. Doesn't even have to have sex in it. <laughs> So I, I sort of wound up blundering awkwardly over this strange career. I went up to FantasyCon 
as a journalist for um, for Penthouse to interview Bob Silverberg there. And did that weird thing that has probably happened to everybody here at some point or another of just looking around and going, ah, I found my people. I am sitting in a bar at 10 o'clock at night. We're talking about books. <laughs> There's this nice lady named Jo Fletcher, who is a, a junior reporter for an Ealing newspaper, and she's telling me stuff about the Ballantine adult fantasy line that Lynn Carter did that I didn't know, and she has books that I've never seen before, and it doesn't get any better than this. And it really didn't, that, it was like, those were my people. So, even things like um, the Duran Duran book, the Duran Duran book came into existence because a month later I went to a British fantasy society open night. Having met these people at fantasy going on, I like these people, these are my people. I went to their open night in a pub and Joe Fletcher, um, the same one who's, who's guest of honor here, um, took me over to Kim Newman, who you interviewed in front of four people at a steampunk convention. And he uh, said, Neil, this is uh, Kim. Uh, Kim's a journalist. He wants to be a novelist. Uh, Kim, this is Neil. Neil's a journalist. He wants to be a novelist. Buy each other drinks. <laughs> and, uh, and we stood there rather, we stood there rather awkwardly. And, and Kim said something about wanting to write um, a horror novel about an evil badger <laughs> called The Set. And I said, what if we did a book of science fiction, fantasy, and horror quotations? And you can do the film ones, and I'll do the book ones. And he said, all right. So that was a book called Ghastly Beyond Belief, which, um, if you can find a copy now, goes for about $150 a book, possibly upwards of that. And, uh, but it has the best cover in the world. I, they let me design the cover because I was young. And I didn't know that authors were not allowed to design covers. <laughs> and the editor on the book, a wonderful editor named Faith Brooker, um, who later on to work for Guides, this was her first book. She was a secretary of the editor. And he'd said, you can edit a book. So she got to edit it. And she didn't know that authors weren't allowed to design <laughs> covers. Um, so we went out to the pub. And, we, um, and I, I designed it on a beer mat. And it had a monster on it, attacking a girl with a bubble helmet, a very tight cost, tight space suit on. And uh, there was a rocket, three-finned rocket ship in the sky, and the word Saturn, and the word ghastly, because it's ghastly, don't believe. I said, it has to be really green and big, and it's got to drip. <laughs> so that was, that was our first book. Um, but while we were working on that, I got a phone call from Kim Newman. And Kim said, um, I'm, I'm doing film books for this company, Proteus. And they were asking if I knew anybody who could do any rock books, and would you like to do a rock book? And I said, yeah, I'd love to do a cool rock book. So uh, 20 minutes later, the phone rings, and it was an editor who was Kim's editor, and she said, we, we understand you, you'd like to do a rock book for us. And I said, yeah, that would be great. Could I do uh, The Velvet Underground? I'd like to maybe follow on with Blue Reed and I could do a really good David Bowie book. And then there's some obscure stuff. I'd love to do a great book about punk. And she said, oh, well, hang on. Uh, we actually have the books already planned. We just need authors. Would you like to do Barry Manilow, Def Leppard, or Duran Duran? Def Leppard, I have a friend who writes for Koran who would be grateful for a book being thrown his way. My friend Dave Dixon, he can write that one. I'll do Duran Duran, they've only made three albums. And, uh, how hard can it be? And I learned a huge lesson when I did it, because I wrote my Duran Duran book, I wrote it as well as I could, and I wrote it in those pre-Google, pre pre-internet days, in a, in a really weird way now. If you think about it now, this is weird.
Because what I did was, I went down to the BBC press office and I said, I would like to buy your clippings file on Duran Duran. And they said, sure. That will cost you 70 pounds for photocopying. And I said, I will pay it. And they went off and they photocopied their entire press file for me on Duran Duran. They gave me this big file and I went away and that was the the basis of the book, all these interviews and articles, and how we wrote them. Um, and it took about three or four months to write. And it came out, and it came out at the height of Duran Duran mania, which meant that within a week, the first print run had sold out. And I had been paid £2,000 for the book as an advance. Um, which I used to pay my rent and buy an electric typewriter, <laughs> moving up from the manual that I had been on. And I was kind of excited about the fact that this book had just sold out its first print run, and we're going to go back to press. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, I will actually make money for the first time in my career. As a starving journalist, I won't be a starving journalist. I could be an adequately fed <laughs> journalist. Um, so I, I was thrilled. And I was significantly less thrilled um, a couple of days later when Proteus Books went into involuntary liquidation, <laughs> being sued by their US distributor, and the entirety of that print run disappeared. The, the only money I ever saw from that book was that £2,000 advance um, and my manual typewriter. But I'd learned something huge, and I'd learned something really big and important. And I went, you know, I only did this for the money. And now I've spent five months of my life, four months of my life, working on a book I wouldn't actually have wanted to read. And I did it as best I could, and I gave it to them. And I didn't get the money. I don't think I'm going to do that again. And it was a huge and important lesson. And it was a huge and important lesson to me, which I then started to see repeated more. As I, as I would watch friends of mine um, who, were, who were real authors, friends of mine who were award-winning authors, friends of mine in, in at least one case, it was world fantasy, award-winning novelist, writing film novelizations under pen names which they'd knock out in three or four weeks, were ashamed of, and were getting paid two or three thousand pounds for. And I jump and I go, but why? All that's ever going to make you do is get up in the morning and hate what you do. I, I don't ever want to write anything again, which I would not want my name on, which I would not want, which I would not stand behind, which I would not want to be proud of. So that um, is what I actually wound up really taking from the Duran Duran book. Let's, let's, let's back up a little bit to, uh, let's take you back to the age of uh, 10, 8. Mm -hmm. So fantasy was clearly something that interested you by the time you got to that fantasy convention. What, what hooked you? I don't remember a time when I wasn't a fantasy fan. There was, there was definitely a time when I couldn't have articulated that I was a fantasy fan. Um, you know, when I was eight years old, if that's where you want to go, my favorite books were the Narnia books. Um, my second favorite books were Roger Lancelin Green's Tales of Ancient Egypt and Tales of the Norsemen, Egyptian and, um, and Norse mythology. I, I was somebody who would get my parents to drop me off in my school holidays at the local library. And I'd go back into the children's library where they had a proper card catalogue. And it was a really good card catalogue because it was a card catalogue that was also organised by subject, not just by name of author, title of book. So I'd go on, I would look for subjects that interested me and they would be things like witches, ghosts, Time travel. 
geniuses. And I just go and find whatever books had, had magic in them. Um, authors, I, lo I loved Tolkien. Um, who I first discovered about the age of eight um, in a book called The Tolkien Treasury, which was just lying around the house, edited by, I assume, Link Carter. Um, but it had an essay in it by Peter Beagle, uh, the same Peter Beagle who is here and being honored this weekend, uh, called Tolkien's Magic Ring. And that was what I learned of, of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Um, I loved P.L. Travels. I loved the, the Mary Poppins stories, which still seem to me to be absolutely the essence of, of pure fantasy. Um, I loved the Armada books of ghost stories. These, these wonderful paperbacks they used to do of scary stuff for kids. And, uh, you know, if I ruled the world, there would be really good volumes of scary stuff for kids available at all times. But I think kids, it's one of those things that you need as a kid. You need the scary stuff. Um, so that was who I was when I was eight. I was a fantasy fan without knowing I was a fantasy fan. By the time I was about 12, the, um, the post-talking, the first wave post-talking fantasy revival was in full swing. I would go down to my local bookshop, the Wilmington Bookshop, and um, they, I would look for the, the Pan Valentine, as they were in, in England, um, fantasy line. So that was where I found Blood in the Mist. That was where I found um, G.K. Chesterton was, was in that line. Uh, James Branch Cabell, um, Lord Dunsany, all of these people who are right now and intermittently considered um, Ernest Brahma, who, who, are, who are considered caviar, considered odd, considered the, the province of people who want to go out and find the rare weird stuff in fantasy. This was the stuff that happened to be on the bookshelves. Following, and essentially what had happened was uh, Lord of the Rings had gone huge, and the Ballantyne line was their attempt to go, well, there's more stuff like this out there, let's just put that on the shelves. But that was the point where it happened to all be on the shelves, and I, as a kid who now had read Lord of the Rings, I, I, they had the two volumes of, first two volumes of Lord of the Rings in my school library, and I read them over and over. Um, Fellowship of the Ring and the Two Towers. And I go back to the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring again. And the Two Towers. When I was 12, I won the school English prize. And they said, what would you like? You get a book. And I said, The Return of the King. <laughs>
I'm in usual lift. I'm dumb. <laughs> I left. So I want to talk about stand-up, and I want to talk about what you were trying to do with Sandman and the fantasy show, and sort of in particular how you want to position it. Now, all the authors at that point, we know that all the book publishers were telling their writers, I don't care what you write, just make it three volumes. Um, that wasn't happening in the comic book industry. No. No. Um, I, I really wanted to write comics. I was convinced that there was really cool art that you could make in comics that nobody had ever made before. And I was intimidated by novels. Because I would look at the shelves of novels and I'd go, you know, you write a novel, you're competing with 3,000 years of really good stuff. In comics, you're only competing with maybe a hundred years of good stuff, and there's so many things people haven't even tried yet that I can actually feel like somebody who's got his machete and is wandering out into a part of the jungle. Nobody's ever been in it. I can clear my own turf. Um, but that came slightly later. What happened first was I, I wrote Black Orchid, I, I, and uh, I got a phone call when we were halfway through Black Orchid from my editor, Karen Berger, and she said, look, we're a little worried. And I said, why are you a little worried? And she said, well, you're two guys nobody's ever heard of, doing a character that nobody's ever heard of, and it's a female character, and they don't sell, and we're worried. And I said, well, what's your solution then? And she said, well, we're not gonna cancel Black Orchid, we want you guys to do it, we wanna bring it out, but we thought, if Dave does a Batman book as well, then it'll raise his profile. We, and if we get you to do a monthly comic, it'll raise your profile, so Black Orchid is less likely to tank. I said, okay. So she said, well, what would you like to do as a, as a monthly comic? And I said, well, how about The Demon, The Phantom Stranger, I listed off a bunch of stuff, and everything I listed off, she'd say no, because somebody else was, was, was doing it. Um, and then she said, what about that Sandman idea you mentioned over dinner the last time I saw you, the idea of doing something with your Simon and Kirby dream character? Um, she said, do one of those. And I thought, okay. <laughs> Went away, I had to write up an outline, had to figure out what I was going to do. And I thought, I don't think I can write superheroes. Don't think I have the engine. May have the chops, don't have the, the drive don't actually have the interest, don't actually believe that there are any problems that can be solved by somebody hitting somebody else through a wall, and then that somebody else standing up and saying, no, you've made me really angry, <laughs> then back to the wall. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so I thought, I have to do something that I can, I can do. And, and I thought, well, what about that thing that Rogers and Isley did, Lord of Light, where he took people who were recreating themselves as the Hindu pantheon, and they felt on a weird gut emotional level, a little bit like superheroes, enough like superheroes, that if you were craving superheroes, that would, that would do. You know, it might have been methadone, not heroin, but it was definitely, <laughs> it would satisfy that craving while doing something else much more interesting. And I thought, like, that I could do, that would be really interesting. And then I thought, I also, it's going to be a horror comic. That was the, the sort of the way that we were looking at it, the way I was thinking at that time. And I thought, I don't want it to be a monster of the month. Because that's how you always do horror comics, they a monster of the month. And I, I thought, I need something that will let me go anywhere without doing that. So as I started to evolve the idea of what Sandman was going to become, I also sat there, almost starting out as a as a nervous sort of um, like like setting parameters for myself of going. Okay, the very first issue of Sandman is going to be classic British horror, sort of like Dennis Wheatley, maybe a little M.R. James. It's going to be one of those. Second episode of Sandman is going to be. 1950s 
Tales from the Crypt, EC style horror, an EC style storytelling. Third one, I want to do Ramsey Campbell, Clive Barkery, very, very contemporary horror. Fourth one, um, in hell, I want to turn upside down, and instead of really doing horror, I want to play with that edge of fantasy that people like Heinlein were working in, in Unknown, back in the 1940s, that I want to feel like a, a sort of that kind of period fantasy. And then um, and I'll do a sort of three-parter after that, which will be much more <coughs> hard, very, very nasty, very uncompromising sort of contemporary horror. And I'll see where that takes me. And it was, it was an interesting sort of trying to, trying to speak all these different languages and seeing where that would take me. Um, and where that actually took me was by the end of the second year of Sandman, I felt like I was pretty much done with horror. It had been really fun. Um, but I'm going, this thing that I did really isn't horror. What is it? And I think that, that you know, at, at some point in there I described it as dark fantasy and that kind of stuff. I'm not really sure whether that meant it, you know, it, it wandered around, it was historical fantasy. It, it always had horror as some kind of little condiment, but then you'd go for issues where there would be nothing scary at all, it would be hard or or weird or... Um, but it very much was, as far as I was concerned, Sandman was part of a dialogue of fantasy, not really part of a dialogue of comics. Um, I, I was, you know, I, I, some of that may have actually been forced on me by DC Comics because it just got very frustrating any time I'd, I'd have a DC Comics character or try and do anything, you know, I'd put the Joker in and they'd say, oh, uh, sorry, Neil, uh, he's just died. <laughs> and I'd go, he's the Joker. And they'd say, yeah, he's just plunged into the Gotham River and he's dead. I'm like, I know he's not. <laughs> And they go, well, we're not going to see him for a year, so can't be the Joker. Oh, How's the Riddler? <laughs> they say, ah, uh, no, he's, he's currently reformed and he's working as a private detective. <laughs> scarecrow? Yeah, no, you can use the Scarecrow. Good, okay, it's the Scarecrow. <laughs> and I'm going to rewrite the thing. And something that was pretty new for comic books. You did research. <laughs> um, and, I mean, and just you did it, I know, to make my life miserable when I was doing, doing these annotations. Um, you oh, did yes. an incredible amount of research into a very wide range of subjects, which shows up in the stories. Why? These are just damn comic books that you do. <laughs> Um, if it's any consolation, people were asking me the same question while I was doing it. <laughs> and um, I remember having not even an argument, because I never really put up a fight, but I remember one, um, one member of the, the science fiction and fantasy community who was writing comics at that point explained to me his or her theory. Um, about writing comics, which was that you should never spend more than 24 hours of your life writing a comic. Mm -hmm. And he or she felt that, you know, that was, that was how much money you got for writing a comic, and it was gonna, you, if you were any more than, you know, if you got to hour 25, you were losing money, and stuff like that. And, and he or she said to me, well, how long do you take to write one? I said, three weeks. And, on a good week, three, good month, three weeks, on a bad month, five weeks. <laughs> then everyone's mad at me. Um, and I was told, well, how can you, how can you make money doing this? You're, you're going to starve. Um, and, and it's true that for much of Sandman, Dave McKean was making more money doing the covers than I was making writing the script. 
Having said that, 22 years, 20, almost 23 years after the first issue of Sandman came out, everything that I did is still in print and selling more than it was the previous year. Um, and nothing that this person did at 24 hours a comic was in print the week after that comic was published. Um, and I, I think that had more to do with why we were doing it. I wanted to make something cool that nobody had made before. I wanted to tell a story in comics that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, but was as long as an ongoing run of comics. I wanted to go from you know, past to future. I wanted to tell every kind of story. And I wanted it to be one huge, grand, two and a half thousand page story when you have to step back from it. And, uh, you know, this sort of, um, The Phantom Tallworth is, I think, just coming up now for its 50th anniversary. And if any of you have not read Norton Juster and, and uh, Pfeiffer's wonderful Phantom Tallworth, you, you should read it. Um, at the very end of it, Milo, the hero, um, he, he's told at the beginning that there is one important thing about this quest that he is on that they cannot tell him. And he gets to the end of the quest and succeeds and says, okay, what was the one thing that I, I, you weren't going to tell me? And they said, well, we weren't going to tell you that it was impossible. <laughs> and he says, what? They said, yeah, it was impossible. He said, yeah. he says, but I did it. He said, that's why we didn't tell you. <laughs> um, and I looked back at what I did with Sandman. It's everything that I did in Sandman is possible now because we changed the rules at some point or other during Sandman to make it possible. Um, the idea of somebody doing a 70 issue series or a 100 issue series, the idea that, 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 a, that, a, that a story in comics would stop when the person who was writing it was done with it was not only unheard of, but the first time I, I gently sort of floated the trial balloon of that idea past my publisher, um, it was explained to me as if to a small child why that was impossible. It wasn't even like, you know, no, we don't do that. Like, me, yo. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> um, and gradually what I started doing was in interviews, I would say, well, Sam, that actually has an ending, and I hope that DC Comics will stop the, the comic there. And people in interviews would say, well, what would happen if they don't? And I would say, well, then I would never work for DC Comics again, but I'm sure it will never get to that point. And everybody at DC Comics is reading the interviews, and gradually they're sort of noticing that this thing is out in trade paper like form, and they don't really want to compromise it, and they've never ever stopped a series that was making money just because a writer left, because you can change a writer, and nobody's ever going to notice, but, uh, you know, and I remember the phone call from Karen saying, uh, so we're going to stop it when you're done. And we don't think you <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about the transition from writing comics to writing prose? Well, I didn't, it wasn't exactly, the, the trouble with um, any kind of narrative where you start talking about transitioning from writing comics to writing prose is people start immediately imagining one of those um, posters showing something you know, a fish, and then it's got legs, and then it's a possum, and now it's a monkey, and now it's a monkey halfway up, and now it's walking, and um, it gets really embarrassing when you then go to film, and people sort of assume you've made it, you have now you started out in comics, and then you've novels, and now you're making films, they go, well, no, it doesn't matter. Um, but I was writing short fiction from the word go. Um, in 1989, during the first year of Sandman, I also wrote Books of Magic and Good Omens, co-wrote Good Omens, which now I look back on it and I go, how did I do that? And I think, well, I was young, I needed less sleep, and I was driven. Um, 
and I still I felt a bit battered by the end of that period. Um, the, um, so I did good elements. And then I, you know, write a short story every now and then to keep my hand in. There was a little bit of prose here and there. Um, but it was, it was mostly <laughs> the reason why I, I couldn't, uh, you know, why, why I was doing comics and then I went over to prose. Is Sandman took up so much of my life. When I started writing Sandman, it was taking me about two weeks a month to write a Sandman. Then it took me three weeks a month, then it took me four weeks a month. As I said toward the end, back in, in Kindly One's time, it was taking me five weeks a month. And that will throw your monthly deadline off. <laughs> um, so the idea that I would do anything else, so people would say, would you do this, would you do that? And I would say, when Sandman is done. So, when Sandman was done, um, I suddenly got to finish Stardust. I got to finish the, the um, I got to take the scripts for Neverwhere and turn them into a novel. I got to assemble my short stories and write some more. Did you feel I, like it required skills that you No, not really. I, I loved writing prose. I wrote relatively decent prose even back then. I, I would be um, hugely thrilled every time Alan Detlow and Terry Wendling would, would pick up a story by me for their, their year's best. And the stories I was writing were getting into year's best. Um, I wanted to learn more about writing prose. I wanted to learn more about the structure of writing a novel. Um, and I was really looking forward to the day that I did a solo novel. But some of that was also just, just really um, but most of it was really just wanting that five weeks a month back to write it. Let's talk about the five weeks a month because it leads me to seems to be filled with about seven or eight weeks per month. Um, you're always on the road. You're always doing public appearances, um, signings, etc. When do you find time to write? And, and how, how do you manage it? And how can others manage it? How can we learn from you these secrets? Don't even try. <laughs> um, actually, the, the, the truth is um, it's getting harder. And it's getting harder and harder and harder. And it's getting harder in ways that, um, you know, all of the things that technology does to make our lives easier is making things harder for me. Um, ten years ago, I would check my email twice a day. And I would check my email by, you know, firing up, firing up my computer, it would go and dial up, it would go and get my emails that morning, I would sit and write some replies, I'd finish off the email, it would go out, and I have felt like I'd warmed up enough to start my day. Um, and they would have been downloaded at 9, and they'd be off at 10, uploaded, and I might do it again at night. Um, but the, the Back then, email was more similar to old-fashioned mail, in that you'd write a letter, you'd send it out, and then you'd get a reply, and that was how it worked. These days, for me, the nightmare, the days that I hate, are the ones where I sit down at 9 o'clock, attack email. As I start email, the replies start coming back in, so I'm replying to them, plus trying to get further down that list of important emails that I have to get to. As the replies are coming in, plus other stuff is coming in, and I turn around, and it's 3.30 in the afternoon, and my daughter is home from school, and I am exhausted, and I haven't quite finished that day's email, and I realize that actually there's probably no real writing of any kind is going to happen that day, because I'm done. And those for me are, you know, those, they don't happen a lot, but they do happen. 
and they are evil days. And um, so I'm actually right now figuring out ways to get back to being a writer. And you know, I, I may well actually, my agent is a nice young man in her agency who I think is about to start answering all of my email for me with nice replies saying, Neil is off writing a book, can I help? Um, and I probably am going to take, I, 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 I suspect I'll wind up taking a holiday from Twitter while I do my next big book project. Um, I'll probably keep blogging because blogging is a nice sort of long form way of saying why I am what I'm doing and I who have no memory actually quite enjoy being able to go when was I in Brazil? I know I was in Brazil at some point in the last decade and I can go to my blog and go, oh, it was November 2002, it says so here, yeah, I'm in Brazil. Um, that's kind of fun. But, um, but I think, I'm definitely feeling like at the end of the graveyard book, um, I was tired. I was I, I tired in a kind of good way. Tired and I'm, okay, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've got all this stuff, and I feel, felt like I've been running at that point for about 25 years. And writing, you know, my, my 250,000 words a year, every year for 25 years, whatever. And it, it just felt at the end of the graveyard book like good. I, I want a break, I want some downtime. Yeah, well, that's enough and I kind of took it. Um, but no, but I've now got to the last few months, I've definitely been going right. It's, so it's, it's time to start writing. What's, what's, what are you working on? What am I working on right now? Um, there's, okay, so things that are finished. There are things that I don't know what they are that are finished. There are things I'm just about to start. Um, I just finished a short book called Fortunately the Milk which was meant to be a picture book for Dave McKean. But it did that thing that uh, Coraline actually wound up doing. Coraline was meant to be 2,000 words. <laughs> and then it was meant to be 3,000 words. And then I thought maybe it'll be 5,000 words. And then, and I kept walking toward the end, and the end kept retreating from it. And this picture book, the idea seemed so simple, and I started it, and it's about a dad who goes off, there's no milk. Um, the, the, their mum has gone away to a conference and she's left dad and her kids and uh, they're out of milk. So, and it's morning and there's cereal, but there's nothing to put on the cereal except orange juice or pickle juice. So, and there's no milk for the dad's tea, so he volunteers to go and get the milk. And he takes ages. And when he comes back, they say, so you, what happened? You got talking to one of your friends down at the corner shop or something? And he says, no, no, no. He starts explaining what happened, how he was beamed up onto an alien spaceship <laughs> who explained that they wanted him to sign over papers on the world, ownership of the world to them, um, so they could remodel it <laughs> with throw pillows <laughs> and, and scented candles. And, and de big decorative plates, which they're going to replace things like the Eiffel Tower with a huge decorative plate with the Eiffel Tower on it. And Australia will be replaced with a large decorative plate with Australia on it. Um, and how, in escaping from them, he winds up 200 years ago being rescued by pirates. And he's rescued from the pirates by a stegosaurus in a balloon. Um, who is a time traveler and a professor. And um, they have these great arguments. About, I'm already thinking about footnotes, maybe. <laughs> 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 there are these great arguments about whether they're in the past or the future, uh, because as far as Professor Steg is concerned, he is 75 million years in the future. And, and they are riding around in his uh, floaty ball person carrier. And our, our hero is saying, well, actually, it's a balloon. And Professor Steg says, who named it first? <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Aztecs, we have vampires. Um, we have all sorts of ecology. So it's more than 2,000. It, it just kept going. <laughs> and, and it's funny. It's just this weird, mad thing that was sort of like, 
you know, channeling, channeling my inner Douglas Adams y thing, but doing it for kids. So, so there's that. So we're not really sure what it is right now. It's finished. But it's definitely not a David McKean picture book. It's something else. So there's that. Um, got, there's a couple of things that I'm sort of noodling around with um, in, a, in a kind of lazy way, doing a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, one is a Grand Guignol musical with Stephen Merritt. Um, one is the next Autumn the Frost Giants book, uh, which is going to be, has a working title, A Lot Goes to Jerusalem. And it actually just started when I discovered that, um, well, it, it was having done the Autumn the Frost Giants, which was really fun, I thought, well, it's such a great character, it'd be fun to send him somewhere else. Where can you send a, a, a Viking? And I thought, well, there's that bit in the Orkney Inga saga where the people on the Orkneys say, ah, let's go to Jerusalem, we need some souvenir ashtrays. And you get this sort of, this wonderful saga about how they go down through Spain where the prince has an affair with a Spanish princess and they head off and go around Greece where they have a close encounter with some pirates and then... Discovery North America. No, no, just because they just go to... to you know, they go to Jerusalem, they buy their souvenir ashtrays, they come home. It's great. Um, so that, I think I'm going to do one of those. It'll be like one of the first chances a bit longer. And that's just something that I'm working on quietly. Um, but the next big thing that I'm going to start working on is going to be American Gods 2. And um, it's, uh, it, it's a book that I was sort of implicit with this stuff in American Gods 1, um, which is like, it's like Lego. And I built it knowing that one day there would be an American Gods 2 and it would fit in like that and people would be impressed by how clever I was. And they'd go, oh, you're so clever. But then, I forgot all about it. <laughs> and continued to forget all about it until very, very early this year. Um, I had to do the giant monster proofread of American Gods for the 10th anniversary edition. It's just came out, in which you, you should all have a free copy of as a gift from HarperCollins in your book bags. Um, so at that point, I'm reading American Gods for the first time in a decade, very, very carefully. And as I'm reading it, I'm noticing all these things that I built in that I meant to click in, and I'm going, oh, I'd forgotten about all that. So, um, and it got me all sort of hot and bothered. <laughs> and so I phoned my editor, Jennifer Brown, and I said, look, would you, how would you feel if I did, would it be okay if I do American Gods 2 next? Thinking that she was going to be stern and say, no, you're contracted for a different book, and you are going to do that different book, young man. But she said, yeah. <laughs> so I'm uh, doing it. Any, any more Sam? Ever? Maybe. <laughs> um, let's put it this way. Because there's nothing I can actually say officially about anything. And, um, I really wanted to do uh, another Sandman thing for Sandman's 20th anniversary. And I said to DC Comics, can we do this thing? And they said, yes. And I said, brilliant. I'm not going to do it for the same terms that I signed up to do Sandman for in 1987 as an unknown author. And they said, well, we can't even think about it. Now. And I said, so millions and millions and millions and millions of these things. And they said, oh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. And uh, as we've been heading towards the 25th anniversary, um, the people who were there at DC who were so easily scared before are no longer there. And the people who are at DC now are a lot less scared. And uh, so I think Put it this way, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if there was something Sandman related 
and completely new out for St. Man's 25th anniversary. Very exciting. Annotated Sandman, first volume comes out, uh, it's four volumes, first volume comes out at the end of this year, and then... Technically, I think it comes out like the first week of January, doesn't it? Something like that, very close to the end of the year, so... Yes. We, we were going to take questions from the audience. The we have time for one, one question. One question, if you stand up and look really attractive, you <laughs> Or sit down and look really attractive. Could they wait until we take them the question? In the back. Yeah, um, the episode Doctor's Wife, um, it seemed like something that was an obvious to see that there's a relationship. I was wondering, is that an idea that was um, in your mind for a long time and you find a chance to do it, or how did that you have to fire itself? The, the, the Doctor's Wife, my Doctor Who episode. Um, which I, I, I'm so thrilled that so many people have liked. Um, it, 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 thank you. Um, the, the, how, did, how did that come about? Was it something I've been sitting on for ages? The weird thing about how... The, I don't know how many of you were here yesterday when Connie and I were talking about where ideas come from and how you get ideas. Because everybody who talks about the doctor's wife with me goes, that was like, how did you come up with the idea of making the TARDIS a person and having her talk to the doctor? And that was, I said, you know, that actually wasn't the idea. The way that the idea went was, I went, wouldn't it be cool to send the doctor deep into the TARDIS being hunted by something? That would be, do sort of like the most dangerous game, but inside the TARDIS, that would be cool. And then I went, but it's not really a challenge because the doctor knows the TARDIS better than anybody. So, um, I should send the companions, or the companion at that point, into the TARDIS, and have the TARDIS being hunted by something else, uh, a companion being, being hunted, that would, that would be really cool. But, the TARDIS is, is sort of nice, what's the TARDIS going to be thinking about all this? Well, why don't I pull the TARDIS's intelligence out and put the TARDIS's intelligence in something else while the companion is there, so that, that gives the Doctor something to do? Okay, so I'll, I'll have this weird little family and I'll stick the, uh, the TARDIS's soul into this girl and that will give her and the Doctor stuff to do while I'm doing this cool companion being hunted through the TARDIS thing, and that was the point I got to, and I phoned Stephen Moffat, and I said, okay, I have a plot, and I said that to him, and there was half a second's beat, and he said, TARDIS girl, I love it, yes, do TARDIS girl. when you explain it to somebody, they go, yes, that's the bit that's really cool. But while I'm sort of putting it together, I can actually go, on, that's the bit that's really cool. I'm just, no, I'm putting the story. It's, it's the story. So um, that was really how it happened. And um, it, was, it was enormously frustrating to write because um, it bounced from one season to the next. So suddenly, Amy being hunted through the TARDIS became Rory and Amy being hunted through the TARDIS. I had to rewrite it to get a three-hander. And every time I would hand in the script, I'd get a thing back saying, we love it, we love it, we love it, we love it, we love it. This is why we can't do it for budget reasons. <laughs> and I would grip my teeth. And House's cool protoplasmic tentacles would vanish. And, and all of the other stuff. And Nephew stopped being huge, scary, patchwork creature. The, the family on the planet, with the exception of Idris, who was something else, um, were... They're actually, the, the original designs went up online. Makeup people were so proud of them, they put them up. And it's like they're stitched, they're these Frankenstein things stitched together from, from other creatures. So, um, I'm battling. <laughs> but anyway, it, it came out, everybody loved it, and, uh, I've never been more proud. We could talk for hours, but we're not allowed to. And I think, uh... It looks like there may be another signing tomorrow. You have a choice of either later going to the information desk to check and see if it is happening or details, or if you wait a few minutes while we try to hassle out these details right now, we'll make an announcement in a few minutes. I, I think 
what he's trying to say is that I may be doing. <laughs> signing to other fans. But there will be another signing. It, it, it won't be Tom. Um, uh, he may be signing to But no, it's, it's, there were so many people who wanted stuff signed last night and today. That we, we, and it's also to allow me to move from place to place without having to lines for me if people want stuff signed. So, uh, yes, tomorrow's signing, which will be?